Father God, we love you. We thank you for being the great I am. We thank you for being all we could ever hope and dream and more. So Father God, this morning as we open your word, as we dive in, let our hearts be open, let our minds be ready and attentive. Lord, let us worship you, not just through music, but through your scripture, through the hearing, through the preaching, through the learning, God. Lord, we just ask that you be clearly evident and present in this moment. In your name I pray, amen. Well, I'm Liam, one of the pastors here, and I wanna welcome you to First Baptist. And this morning, we're gonna dive into Jeremiah chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah 17. If you don't, you can grab a Bible in the pew in front of you and open it to Jeremiah 17. Or you can look at the screens if you wanna do it that way as well. So we're gonna be at Jeremiah 17. It's one of my favorite passages. It has just so much to unpack. Uh, and, and I've still got an hour left in the service, so I'm good to go, right? Not going to lose anybody during the next hour, hour and 10 minutes that I'm preaching, right? Y'all good with that? No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I could. Don't tempt me. Seriously. Jeremiah chapter 17. But first, I want to tell you, because in 1919, that was before my time, 1919, the Boston Red Sox had a pitcher. And they had been to the World Series a couple of times, 1914, 1918. Uh, they'd won a few World Series there, and they had this pitcher, and he was amazing. He was great, one of the best pitchers at the time. And the thing about baseball, Major League Baseball, they didn't have the designated hitter. Okay, so the Atlanta Braves are in the National League. They don't have the designated hitter, so the pitchers, when they pitch, they have to bat. In the American League in baseball, they have the designated hitter, so somebody bats for the pitcher. Well, in 1918, 1919, there was no designated hitter. The pitchers would have to bat. Well, this one pitcher for the Boston Red Sox was an amazing pitcher. But then he would come up to bat, and he was an amazing hitter. So the coach decided early in this guy's career, whenever you're not pitching, you're going to play the outfield. So you're going to be both. You're going to be an outfielder for us and a pitcher for us. They had him several years. Well, the owner didn't like him. He had troubles off the field. He had troubles on the field. He had a bad attitude, a temper. And so the owner was looking for a reason to kind of trade him away, get rid of him. And then in 1919, the Boston Red Sox, who were favored to be one of the best teams, did terrible. Their team didn't make the playoffs. They weren't any good. It gave the owner a good reason to get rid of this guy, one of their star players. Well, the owner of the Boston Red Sox was opening a theater. And he was having trouble funding the grand opening and the, and the renovations he was needing to do to this theater. So he thought, hmm, this is a good opportunity. So he called the New York Yankees. I don't know why as a Red Sox you would ever do that, but he did. And he called the New York Yankees and said, I've got this guy named George, and I would like to trade him to you. And they said, what do you want? And he said, $100,000. Well, in 1919, that's good money, but it's not outrageous uh, kind of money, and especially if you're not asking for a player or anything. And so the Yankees said, absolutely, we'll take him for $100,000. Here you go, write a check, get the player. So this guy named George, George Herman, George Herman Ruth, also known as Babe Ruth, went to the New York Yankees. Therefore, setting in motion uh, one of the greatest baseball players ever to play, if arguably maybe the greatest player to ever play baseball. Well, since 1919, there was this thing that hung over the Red Sox to where they wouldn't win another World Series until 2004. And people called it the curse of the Bambino. Anybody ever heard of this? Have you, anybody? Okay, so a lot of you have heard of this. It's the curse of the Bambino. Red Sox would not win the World Series. So in 2004, by the way, I'm a Red Sox fan. Uh, growing up, rooted for the Red Sox. Uh, family grew up in Boston, so I kind of have a connection there. So not a bandwagon fan. I was rooting for them when they were bad in the 80s, okay? So, um, and so the curse of the Bambino hung over them for years till they, so they wouldn't win the World Series. But do you know the curse of the Bambino actually didn't even come about until 1990. It was never even published, never called that until 1990. In a book published, uh, this call, it was called The Curse of the Bambino. It was a, in a book, and uh, it was the first mention of it, and the newspaper started picking up on it, and then it became very popular in the 90s to follow the curse of the Red Sox. Well, in 2004, they reversed that, and they won the World Series with a bunch of characters with big beards. I, Pretty sure Duck Dynasty played baseball for a year just to break the curse because they all had these gigantic beards that year. They're all characters. And so, and so they won the World Series in 2004 and reversed the curse. Well, there's a lot of other 
famous curses out there. And we're gonna talk about a few of those here in just a second. But I wanna go to Jeremiah chapter 17 because that kind of curse is not necessarily what we're gonna talk about in Jeremiah 17. Although that might be what we think of when we hear curse. So let's look at Jeremiah 17, verses five through 10. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to to the fruit of his deeds. If you're taking notes, we're gonna have five points today. Um, in the little worship card that you picked up with the tree on the front, on the back, there's a place to take notes. So it's very easy, you can take notes. I got five points here. And the first one I wanna talk about is a man cursed. A man cursed. I've talked to you about the curse of the Bambino for the Red Sox. Well, here's a few other curses that I just kinda of happened to read about and look up. Uh, uh, the Chicago Cubs, another baseball team, the Chicago Cubs, and the Billy Goat Curse. They haven't won a World Series in forever because of a goat. Um, it's still going on, okay? So they're still cursed, so to speak. There's the Campbell Soup Can Curse, and that has to do with athletes and commercials and things like that. The Madden Cover Curse. Uh, the 27 Club, that's for musicians who died at the age of 27. The Curse of King Tut. For all those who opened his tomb, they're cursed. And the last one that I, I found, and I didn't know this, I actually just learned about this curse this week, um, James Dean's car. How many of you, how many of you have ever heard of this, this so-called curse? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. I'd never heard of this. James Dean's car. James Dean had a car, you know, and you know James Dean is the actor. He died young, and, and his car was sold, and uh, it was in multiple accidents, and after multiple accidents with multiple fatalities in each accident, they, they stripped the car apart and took apart the car and sold the engine, sold the tires, sold the body, sold everything. And so the stories have come in that every time a part was sold off, an accident would happen around it. So it was cursed, so to speak. Well, when the Bible says in verse five, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man, it's not the same thing as what we call a curse. I'm not talking witchcraft. I'm not talking black magic. I'm not talking about a spell. I'm not talking about an item that if you touch, all of a sudden it becomes bad mojo, okay? It's not Indiana Jones. So what does the Bible mean when it says, cursed is the man who trusts in man? Well, let's define curse. We can define it as this. A curse is something, is set with negative consequences. Well, that seems like the curse we talk about, right? Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, if you know me and you've heard me preach or hear my Bible studies, you know there's gonna be a Hebrew word or a Greek word thrown in there. And if you don't like that, you're really not gonna like this morning because I got several. So the first one here is arar. It's a Hebrew word, arar, and it means curse, but it's not like a spell is to be disconnected from that which is good. It's to be completely disconnected from that which is good. And, and I've got, I got a good example, and it's a biblical example. If you've ever heard of Balaam, now we all know Balaam. If you go to church and you, were, you grew up hearing all the Old Testament Bible stories, you probably know Balaam as the guy who had the donkey that talked. Now most of the time you would just think the guy's crazy, but this donkey, talk to him. He's riding along the road and he's heading to see a king and, and the, the donkey stops in the road and turns and goes through a field and, and Balaam's like, no, get back on the road, you know, you stubborn mule and, you know, and he's, he's, he's hitting the donkey and the donkey stops and then turns again and, 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 and the, Balaam gets off his donkey and, and starts hitting the donkey and the donkey looks at him and goes, what did I do to you? Now, would that scare anybody in here? If, you know, if you're riding along and all of a sudden you, 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 hit, you hit the horse or the donkey, or whatever, like, go, just go faster, go faster. And he's like, why are you hitting me? You know, that would just, I would, I would have some reservations in the moment. I gotta be honest. 
And, and Balaam's eyes were, were opened and there was an angel of the Lord and God uh, had, some, had some dealings with Balaam in the moment. But Balaam went on to visit a king. Now, this king had the land and outside of his land, the Israelites were camped. And so the king said, Balaam, come to me, come to me. And so Balaam came and said, I want you to curse these people so they don't attack me, they don't come and they can't overcome me and conquer my land. I need you to curse these people. Here's an altar. And so Balaam went, did his thing and comes back to the king. He says, I can't curse them. God won't allow me to curse them. In fact, by, by doing what I did, God's now blessed them even more. And the king is outraged. I'm not paying you to bless my enemies. I want you to curse them. So he takes Balaam to another altar. And he says, here's another altar, curse them. He goes, okay, let me see what I can do. And so Balaam does his sacrifice and his thing and he comes back to the king and says, king, God won't allow me to curse them. In fact, he's blessed them again even more. And the king is outraged. And I'm reminded of that story of how Balaam goes to curse the people, but God's like, no, these are my people that you cannot curse them. In fact, I'm gonna bless them more. The curse here is not a magic spell that somebody just throws on you and all of a sudden now you, you have all this bad luck. It's not breaking a mirror or walking under a ladder or anything like that that's superstition. The curse here is being disconnected from that which is good that causes blessing. And in this case, he tried to curse Israel, but Israel was the people of God, and God said, no, we are in connection. You can't break that. Verse five says, thus says the Lord, the cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in you to make sure you're okay? and your family's okay? Because I tell you, I, I can just, I, let me just be honest with you, can I just be honest? If you trust in me long enough, I'm gonna let you down at some point, because I'm not perfect. And if I trust you continually all the time, there's some point, something's not gonna be exactly the way we had hoped the arrangement went, and you might disappoint me at some point. Why? Because we're human. But the Lord, when we put our trust in the Lord, we begin to see things differently. But when we trust ourselves and we don't trust the Lord, it says, cursed is that man. You are separated from the Lord and God in that relationship that brings goodness and blessing. And then it compares that man to a shrub. It says, a shrub will not see any good come. He'll dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited land. The man who puts his trust in himself and not the Lord will never see God. A photographer was hired to go and take pictures of a wildfire. There's a huge wildfire and it was raging out of control. And they said, hey, we need you to go take pictures of this wildfire. Go to the airport and, and go to the hangar and a pilot will come around with a small plane. You get in the plane, go take some pictures. So the, the, the the photographer gets to the airport and he goes to the hangar and right about the time he gets there, and he, he was running a little bit late, uh, a small Cessna pulls around and the photographer jumps in and says, hey man, I'm sorry I'm late, let's just get going so we can get this thing done. And pilot nods and they go out taxi to the runway and line it up and take off and the photographer starts getting really worried because it's a very rough takeoff. I mean, he's kind of bumpy and all over the place and it's just not steady and he's like, this, this doesn't feel right. I mean, he's kind of a little wild and loose all over the place. But they finally get off the ground and they start taking off and, and, and they finally see a good area of the wildfire that he thinks would be a good place to take pictures. And he says, hey, he taps the pilot and says, hey, fly as low as you can to the fire. He looks back and says, why would we wanna do that? He says, because I've gotta get some good pictures. I was hired to take the best pictures of this wildfire and I need to get close. To which the pilot responded, so you're not the flight instructor? <laughs> Be careful in whom you place your trust. Make sure it's in the one who you know 
has all the securities available to you. Cursed is the man who trusts in his own flesh. This flesh is fleeting. It's not gonna last forever. But the Lord is the master of forever. The Lord gives us salvation. A man cursed. Second, I wanna see a man blessed. Look at verse seven. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. For it does not cease to bear fruit. So let's, we define curse, so let's define blessed. Okay, blessed. To be filled with God's benefits. Look, can, can I take a moment? If you're listening to pastors preachers, evangelists who get up and say God's blessings equal bank accounts, cars, houses, and money. They're wrong. It might lead to some of that, but it's not a guarantee of that. God's benefits is the blessings. If God chooses to benefit you in a way that says, hey, I'm gonna give you businesses and money so you can bless others with that, that's God's benefit in that way for you. But for some of us, for some of you, he's not saying, hey, I'm gonna give you tons of money. He says, I'm gonna give you tons of something else to use for my name and my glory. So if we only judge our lives and our benefits from God in a monetary Western American dream society, many of us will be very disappointed in who we've made our God out to be. But if we view things as Jesus views things, if we view people as Jesus views people, if we view this life as God views our lives, we'll start to begin to think, man, maybe it's not for my glory. Maybe it's not my will be done, but his will be done. Maybe it's not, hey, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, but I'm gonna do what he wants to do so he can be glorified and other people can come to know him. And whatever that transaction is between us and God and those blessings and benefits, that is God's prerogative. Because we trust that God knows best, even when we don't understand it. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord whose trust is in the Lord. Hey, did you notice it just said that twice? Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. Now, sometimes in the Bible, it'll reiterate things and say things twice to make a point, to make sure that you get it, to make sure that you get it. See what I did there? See what I did there? That would get annoying if I kept doing that, I'm gonna stop. So, but the Bible sometimes will say things over and over and over again so that it will hammer it home that hey, this is important. Truly, truly, I say to you. You ever heard that verse? Or if you go old school, it's like verily, verily. Or as an old preacher I heard one time, he goes, be Riley, be Riley. <laughs> it's funny. I think my dad told me that joke. So cheesy. That's like, that's like cheesy church humor. I love it. Okay. So I was like, okay, well, maybe in this case, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord is a reiteration for our benefit to know that we need to trust the Lord. But being the kind of guy I am, I go back and I have to study every single word. I realize it's not the same thing. There's actually two words here, trust and trust, but they're two different Hebrew words. The first one, blesses the man who trusts in the Lord, that word is batak, batak. And it means to kneel down, to put your trust in. It's an action. It means that you say, I'm going to do this. I am going to kneel before God. I'm gonna put my trust in him. It's an action. I have to do this. I have to choose for myself to give up trust in me, put trust in God. The second one, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. The second one is mibtak, and it means confidence or security in. So, so let's read that one more time with, with those two ideas in mind. Here we go. 
Blessed is the man who actively puts his trust in the Lord to kneel down and give him our trust, whose security and comfort and confidence is in the Lord. One's an action, one's an emotion. Do you realize that we live in a society that is opposite of what the Bible just told us to do? Here's what we do. Here's what our society teaches us. Here's what our human nature says we want to do. I found something that makes me feel safe, so now I'm gonna go trust it. I have confidence in this, so I'm going to go and be with this. I feel secure when I'm with this or I'm doing this, therefore I'm putting my trust in that because of the way it made me feel. Do you realize that Jesus doesn't ask you to evaluate your feelings and then come to him? What it says is blessed is the man who decides to trust Jesus And those who trust Jesus will then have security and confidence in the faith that they've placed in Jesus because of who he is. He is asking you to choose him first and then your emotions will follow after him. But we sit in church and we go through our daily lives going, I wanna know how I feel first and then I will choose whether to follow Jesus. I wanna know how I feel about this mission trip and then I will choose to follow Christ. I wanna know if, I, if I'm comfortable giving up that much money to tithe, and then I will trust Jesus. I wanna know if I feel comfortable enough leaving the United States to go do a mission project, and then I will follow what Jesus commanded to make disciples of all nations. I wanna know if I feel comfortable in my, how young I am to go and give up all my promise and potential to, to serve Jesus in that way. I want to know if I feel comfortable in my older age and leaving all the comforts of home behind to go serve Jesus somewhere. We evaluate ourselves so many times on our feelings first and then our decision to trust Jesus second. And Jesus says, just come to me. Put your trust and faith in me. And those whose trust and faith in me will be rewarded with security confidence. It's a hard, hard thing to sell when people come and sit down and say, Make me believe. When they sit down and say, why should I trust Jesus? Don't you know what I've been through? How, do you, how can you dare ask me to trust Jesus when he's allowed me to go through X, Y, Z? That's a hard argument to make, except Jesus asked for our trust. Because Jesus is God. And blessed is the man who puts his trust in God, the maker of the universe. It says, the blessed man is like a tree. Hey, have you ever been to West Texas? Did you go there on purpose? I'm just, uh, <laughs> I've been twice, and yes, both times I went on purpose, and I've been to West Texas. There's not much in West Texas. Well, every time I go to West Texas, I feel like I should wear like a native poncho, six-shooter, and every time I step, I should hear spurs clinging, cling, cling. You drive through West Texas and it's just like barren, tumbleweeds, cactus. There's not much there. But when I'm driving through West Texas for the first time, I saw off in the distance this really bright green strip of trees. And I was like, well, that's, that's interesting. There's nothing out here. And then all of a sudden there's just this bright green row of trees off in the distance. You know what I learned when I saw those, when I went to find out about those trees? Every time I saw bright green trees, there was water. A stream, a river, a lake. Every time you see bright green leaves and anything taller than five feet, in West Texas, there's abundance of water. And so as I'm reading this passage in Jeremiah 17, it says, blessed is the man who is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. See, the cursed man is like the shrub in the desert. He doesn't see God. He doesn't see the good because he's a shrub in the desert, barely striving to survive, barely hanging on emotionally and spiritually, whose family may be falling apart, whose job may be falling apart, who spiritually were disconnected from God, and so we're like that shrub in the desert that we, we don't have that connection with him. And when the heat comes, they're scared to death. 
wondering if this is gonna be the summer that burns them too much. But the blessed man, the man who trusts in the Lord, is like the tree who's planted by the water and he sends out his roots by the stream and he does not fear when the heat comes for its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought. It does not cease to bear fruit. Those rooted in Jesus know no matter how hard times get, they can fall back on him and they trust him. Psalm 125 says, blessed is the man who puts his trust in the Lord. He is like Mount Zion and cannot be moved. Man, I was reading that this week and I was like, whoo, now that's a verse for your life. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He's like Mount Zion and he cannot be moved. But cursed is the man who trusts in his own flesh. Number three, I want you to see a man deceived. Now this next verse, this next verse is, it's kind of heavy. Are you ready for it? Verse nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Deceived. Deceived just means to be tricked or misled. Now, the Hebrew word for deceived here is a kob, and it means to be tricked into thinking you've got one thing, and then all of a sudden it switches and you've got something different, and it was not what you were wanting, hoping, or expecting. You were tricked. The heart can be a very, very tricky thing. It's such a powerful thing. It's the seat of our emotions. We say the heart is the seat of our emotions. It's extremely powerful. That's why we have, uh, you know, it's everything about love is about the heart. And then when we, we have something bad happen in a relationship, we, it breaks our heart, right? Because the heart is so powerful. The heart desires, the heart wants and it surrounds love. Now, falling in love is great, right? I mean, everybody's like, I wanna fall in love, you know, and everybody desires love. We all wanna be loved. So is it good for me to fall in love with a woman? Yeah. I fell in love with this woman years ago, and I still am in love with that woman. But what if I fall in love with another woman? That's a problem. I'm glad we agree with that, baby. <laughs> if I come home and I go, I just wanna let you know, I fell in love with another woman, I couldn't help it. I fell in love. That's when the Bible says we gotta guard our hearts. We guard against allowing things like that to happen. Because the heart is so powerful, love is so powerful, we make excuses like, I couldn't help it. When all along the Bible teaches us to put hedges around us, guards around us, we put our guard up to protect our heart, to protect ourselves because Christ is the one who's supposed to have our heart. And he has carefully outlined who we are to be in Christ and how we are to love. So to fall in love is great in the right circumstances, situations, and in a biblical godly way. And it's so romanticized in the story, Romeo and Juliet. I mean, they've made so many movies. They've even made a cartoon called Gnomeo and Juliet about gnomes, which is actually a pretty cute cartoon. You got two-year-olds, you watch this kind of stuff. One of my favorite authors, Billy Shakespeare. I call him Billy because I like him. Uh, and Saturday Night Live I called him Billy. William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, well, Okay, for any literature people out there, he took pieces of other stories, incorporated them all together, and then put a little original spin on some of it. But William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. And it's such a sweet story, isn't it? He falls in love with her. Rival families, they can never be together. So if we can't be together, we don't wanna be with anyone. We'd rather die, and so they do. If you haven't read it, I'm sorry if I spoiled the ending. <laughs> it's a little bit old. You should have read it by now. But we romanticize it and think it's such a great story. Do you know how old they are in the story? Juliet is 13 years old. And Romeo is 
also a young Romeo, it says. We're talking about middle schoolers and we've romanticized this thing about love and how powerful the heart is and how powerful love is. And I think it's a great illustration that, that the power of love and the power of the heart can make us blind to things at times. And we must set guards and hedges around our life to protect ourselves and protect our heart. A man can be deceived by his heart because the Bible right here, it says it's not my words, it's God's words. The heart is deceitful above all things. I wrote a quote. I, I, was, I was sitting there thinking, I was like, man, I've gotta, have, I've gotta have a good quote here. This is such deep stuff. This is such this is such a tough subject for me all week to chew on. I was like, I gotta write something good, a good quote that I could put on my board, put on my bulletin board for me just to look at. And here's what I came up with. Here's what I came up with. Our heart will produce in us the feeling of invincibility while leaving us in a state of vulnerability. That's why we get broken hearts. Because the heart will leave us in a state, uh, will lead us to the feeling of invincibility while leave us, leaving us in a state of vulnerability. Because we think it's so strong and it's gonna last and it's so wonderful and it's awesome and then we realize, oh, it's gone. And in that moment, it's fleeting. The heart can deceive us. So we must be careful. Next, a, a man's sick. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. I'm not going to discuss the Hebrew word. You can go look it up because we have small children. And if I said it, it would sound kind of inappropriate. So there you go. There's some homework to interest you. The Hebrew word for sick means incurable. The heart is deceitful above all things and it's incurable. What do we do with that? What, would, what do we do with that passage? Here's what we do with that passage. Jesus didn't come to take us and give us a makeover. Jesus didn't come and take our heart and say, okay, I'm just gonna shine it up a bit because you know your heart's good. I'm gonna just shine that up a bit. Jesus came and said, you know what? You are sinful and you have fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of your sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He didn't come to just shine us up and polish us up and say, hey, here's who you are. Now you're a little bit nicer. No, Jesus said, you know what? I'm gonna come and take the place of your heart. I'm gonna come in and take the throne of your heart. It's no longer my way, it's his way. It's not the old self, it's a new self. The Bible says that Jesus came to give us life, which means there was no life before that. Which means we're not doing good and we just need a little bit of help getting over the hump to heaven. He says, man, you are totally and helplessly sinful and Jesus came to give us a whole new spiritual life. Six of you love that. That was great. Is anybody here glad? Let's just go glad. Glad that Jesus offers a whole new life for salvation the heart is deceitful and it's sick, it's incurable. Jesus didn't come to just cure it, he came to replace it with him. And the last one is a man tested. Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. I found something very interesting when I was reading this, this verse. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. Now that immediately brought to mind for me King David when he says, Oh Lord, search me, try me, know my thoughts, know my ways, my wicked ways. Come and search me completely, God, and show me if there's any wicked way in me because I want to follow you and I want to get rid of the wickedness inside me. I want, I want salvation and I want love and I want forgiveness and God, I want you, so search me so I can get rid of this. So that's what came to mind as I'm reading I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. So I looked up the word mind. If, you, if you're reading the King James Version, it says, I test the reins. 
But it's not like the horse reins, like you'd put on a horse. In fact, this Hebrew word it can be translated as mind, but do you know this, this literally means, get this, kidneys. Now that would read weird. I, the Lord, search the heart and I test your kidneys. But what it was really saying, in Hebrew and Greek, very similar, it, it's not necessarily, a, it's, it's a picture a lot of times. And so what it means is the inward parts, your deepest parts, it, it, the heart is the seat of our emotions, right? Okay, we just talked about that, you know, you know, don't tell my heart, my achy, bricky heart, you know, that, you know, and stuff like that, okay? I left my heart in San Francisco. You know, these great love songs, uh, uh, achy, bricky heart, great, okay, debatable, but anyway, so the seed of the emotions is the heart for us. Do you know what it was early in the Old Testament? The bowels. That's not good for love songs. <laughs> but this is the word it means. It means the inward parts, your insides. It means literally the kidneys. So when, it, when it's saying, I search the heart and I test the mind, I test the kidneys, I, I test what's inside of you to see who you really are. The, the number one function of the kidneys is to filter toxins, filter out all the things our body doesn't need so we can get rid of all that stuff, right? So what if you had a filter spiritually in your life, morally in your life, and God came around to check your filter and see all your dirt on a regular basis? If he just pulled it out and said, look at your filter, yuck. My furnace went out Christmas Eve night. Yes, Blessed. So about 8.30, 9 o'clock, we noticed, man, it's getting cold in the house. So I went and checked the thermostat, and it's like 61 degrees. We're like, it's getting cool for my babies, you know? So I did what any dad would do. It's like camping, woohoo! <laughs> throw them all in the bed, throw an extra blanket on it, we're all good. And so I go around, I'm cleaning the filters. I'm like, okay, these filters aren't bad. Oh, this one's pretty dirty. Okay, so we're, we're going around, you know, I'm looking at the filters and realize, you know, this one filter hasn't gotten changed lately, and it was filthy. Now I replaced the filters, and it's, it's going to need a little motor in the furnace, but it just, just having to change that filter reminded me of this. I, I search your heart, and I know all, all the dirtiness inside you and, and who you are, what you do, and God knows us, so we can't escape who he is. And here's the, here's the cool thing. He says, I search all that. And I know you. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord judges the motives of the heart. God knows you. And here's the great news. Here's what's so awesome about this. Ready? He loves you anyway. Do you have people in your life who know the bad stuff you've done and they love you anyway? I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that a loving God knows every bad thing I've ever done in my life and he goes it's all right you're my son and I love you and I want you and he embraces me and forgives me and he loves me so much that even before I knew he who he was he was already dying for me before the foundations of the world Jesus went to the cross before he knew you before he knew me because he's always known us and he's always loved us And I'm so thankful that my God doesn't look at my life and go, you've messed up one too many times, I'm rejecting you now. Because my salvation and grace and love and forgiveness from God is not based on my merit, it's based on Jesus's. It's not my perfection, it's Jesus's. It's not my sacrifice that gets me into heaven, it's Jesus's. And so I serve a savior who loves me in spite of all that. So no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, no matter how 2013 treated you or how 2014 might already be shaping up to be, I can tell you this, God loves us. A man cursed is like those who are a shrub and disconnected from the living water. A blessed man is like a tree whose roots go into the water. A man deceived is one who follows his heart 
with every desire and whim. And Galatians says that the flesh, those who belong in Christ, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. A man sick understands Jesus is the answer. And the Lord tests us. You see, this whole passage is about obedience. Judah, the country, had sin. And Jeremiah was the prophet. And he was foretelling that the city was going to be destroyed by its enemies. And they turned away from God. But, even though they turned away from God, God promises that if they will turn back to him, he will restore them. So the good news for you, the good news for me, the good news for everyone is that if we will turn to Jesus, he will give us life. Or if you know Jesus and you've just wandered away, he will restore you and the right relationship with him. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. So this morning, here's my question. Will you trust the Lord? Not because you feel good about it. Not because you feel something towards it. Not because he makes you feel a certain way, but because you can trust him. And you can choose to trust him. And this morning, right where you are, you can trust him. As we begin singing here in just a moment, I'm just gonna be down here just because there might be somebody who says, hey, I just need to talk to somebody. I need somebody to pray with me and for me. I, I wanna be able to do that. I wanna be available for you if you want me to. If you say, hey, I just need to come and I need to kneel down, we're gonna make this one of those kind of altars. We do that because it's biblical. There's an altar and we lay our sacrifice to God on an altar. So we're gonna just make this kind of an altar where we come and we can lift up whatever you need to lift up to God and surrender to actively kneel down and place our trust in Jesus. And this morning, whatever you need to do to be in right relationship with God, I encourage you to do that. Choose to trust in Jesus. Father God, I ask that if anyone here does not know you, that they come to know you today. Lord, if they have not put their trust in you, that they will fully trust you. You're our rock. You're our king. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me?